Mr. Eric Snow. How you doing, sir? I'm doing good, man. How are you, man? Man, I'm blessed. Blessed. Uh, thank you for coming on the show, The Rematch, uh, BasketballNews.com and Fly TV. Um, 14 years in the NBA. Um, and then you went into coaching and you was coaching assistant coach for the Texas Legends for a long time. Um, me personally, I kind of always knew that you was going to go into coaching. You, you just had that demeanor about you. Um, but talk about your love for, for coaching. Well, man, I think it's just more for my love for helping guys. Um, I just think that, you know, coaching is a way that I can do that. And at the same time, I can, you know, be around the game of basketball. So I think it was more of just being around the game of basketball and at the same time being able to help some young guys accomplish their dreams. Um, so for me, that was, you know, what I enjoyed the most. Okay, that's what's up. That's what's up. So, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on right now uh, with your old team, Philly. And, um, you know, I, I want to first talk about and, and first set the scene for how special of a place Philly is to play. Um, I did an article with um, Theo Ratliff and Larry Hughes and George Lynch, and they all talked about how special the Philly fans are. Um, you know, talk about how special of a place it is to play in Philly. I mean, it's a great place. It's a tough town, but it's it's a great place. I mean, like I would always say, um, they will get on you hard, but they're family. They get on you hard, but they won't let anybody else get on you. So, um, right. but the love was there um, from day one. Um, when you go out in the streets and you go anywhere, um, they they're very passionate. Um, they die hard, but they were very supportive of me. I mean, people they get on us, um, but at the same time, you got to respect it because they they cheer for you and. The passion is always there, the enthusiasm, and it's for all the sports too. You know, we just happen to be, you know, just a portion of the sports in the city. But they're very, very passionate, very knowledgeable um, fans. But y'all had a special team, and you really felt the love um, from yeah. Philly. And people talk about how tough Philly Philly is, you know, to play in. But when you're playing well, and you're playing hard, and you're playing with heart, the way that your teams played there, I mean, you get a lot of love, right? Well, I think you got, for the most part, you got a lot of love because they notice if you play hard. They know if you compete. Um, if you miss a shot or if you don't do this and that, yeah, they get upset or they do things. But at the end of the day, it's really about are you trying your best and playing hard? And I think they appreciated that the most part from our team. And at the same time, our best player, that's what he was about. Allen Iverson was about playing hard and showing that heart. So it became sort of a staple of our team that they, they knew that they were going to get that part out of us. You know, you mentioned Iverson, and he had a lot of respect for you. I mean, y'all had a special relationship. And I remember him seeing talk about, um, you know, your defense, for one, and how much it, the way that you played pushed him to work harder on the defensive end. Um, you know, so talk about gaining that amount of respect for a superstar like Allen Iverson um, and, and how you actually did that. Well, I mean, I think the first thing is, you know, Allen is real. So you got to be real with him and real and honest. And, and when you're around him, you, you'll notice that he just he's just a real guy. He's not it's no fake and it's no games. And he just know that we play hard. And but more than anything, showing them that you care about him, him, the person, not him, the basketball player. And if you show him that care, that love and that respect and you go out and you fight for him, He's going to do the same thing for you and, and vice versa. And that's what he did. I mean, he seen we were, you know, I fought for him. He fought for me. And the, the, the mutual respect and the friendship just grew from there. You know, I, I heard AI um, talk about how you used to set him up perfectly on offense. And he was talking about how you would get him the shots and get him the ball, like in the perfect spot. And he was saying that you understood him as a player. And I want to talk about that aspect of it because how important it is um, for how, how important it was for you to really understand AI uh, both on and off the court. Well, I mean, he's so competitive that he, you know, AI felt like whenever he had the ball in his hands, he was going to score or he could score. But it, it, it was my job to not just for Allen, but for everybody, try to put him in position. To, to do what they do best. I mean, Allen, yes, you can give him the ball and he can make things happen, but it helps if, you know, the, his defender's trailing him or if you can kind of give him 
a little nod that maybe fade or you know come off that screen or hey next time he's coming he's running so hard just stop and then get separation and then use your speed so if you kind of talk him through those situations because he just want to play he just want to compete he's going to make it happen but sometimes mm-hmm. if you can give him that little edge um you know that's when at times he just became unstoppable and and ai described you as and you're very humble um you're just a humble person uh, but AI described you as the the missing piece of the puzzle that completed the team. That's how he described Eric Snow. Yeah. And, you know, he said that you were responsible, and he said you in particular were responsible for a lot of the success that they had as a team. Now, those are glowing remarks from somebody. You know what I mean? I know you're humble, but you really were really crucial to that team as far as controlling everything, orchestrating everything from the point guard position and really putting everybody in their places. And I'm really, I'm really staying on this because the point guard position is so important. I I think it's the most important position on the floor um, for me personally, but everything falls after the point guard you know what i mean i mean you have the ability to control people's emotions to bring people up slow everybody down know when to go you know quickly know everybody's personality so you know you being that special puzzle that piece of that puzzle i mean you know that's a lot you know what i mean that's a lot saying for you (laughs) well i mean i think you know if you you talk about just a game of basketball and you look at maybe my career and if you watch me or didn't watch me um you know, it was a lot of things I didn't do well. Um, but I think the one thing that, and, you know, I think talking to Monty Williams, like later in my career, like, you know, we were retired and he kind of said something to me that I didn't realize how important it was. And, and I think probably the best thing I brought to the table that I had a, an ability to kind of pick up things very quickly. Mm. Um, you know, coach Brown could go over a play or he can go over a, a sequence of what he wanted the team to do. And I was able to grab like all five positions at one time and be able to point everybody where they supposed to go immediately. And during the game, it was kind of something that I thought was kind of normal, but people would always tell me like, yo, that's not normal. Mm. Like what you're doing, Mm. like how you're helping people and all of that. Like, that's not like, you know, all the positions instantly. So I think that was probably the best thing that I, that, in my career that I was able to, to do, um, because I think it where at times you make up for the lack of talent or lack of shooting or lack of whatever you had, being able to know things and kind of put yourself in position and put your teammates in position to kind of have an edge was kind of something that was you were able to do. And, and your teammates had full confidence and, had and trust in you, right? Would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I think, but you, you, you earn that. I mean, I think that um, the one thing about trust and respect in your teammates is that you gotta, you gotta give what you want back. You know, I was able to, to, to show them the respect and show them the love and, and help them out. Um, that you know, once you kind of build that trust and you build that respect, they're gonna give it back to you, and that's what I was able to do. So I want, I'm, I'm gonna now shift to current times with the um, 76ers team and. I, I want to kind of compare and contrast the the chemistry or or lack yeah. thereof um, happening now with the 76ers, um, in particular, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons. And, you know, we could go back to the comments that Joel Embiid made after the, the playoff loss last year, um, where he, in essence, you know, he kind of blamed Ben Simmons for the loss. <laughs> And um, you know we can we can we can play it and we can listen here. What was the moment for you personally tonight where your be- your belief in what uh, you had in terms of this being the Sixers' year turned to the recognition that it just wasn't going to happen? Um, man, uh, I'll be honest. Um, I thought the turning point was, uh, uh, you know, when. Um, we, um, I don't know how to say it, um, but I thought the turning point was just, you know, we had, uh, 
an open shot and you know we miss uh, we made one free throw and uh, we missed the other and then they came down and scored. Uh, At this point I don't care about that man honestly he does whatever he wants uh, you know that's not my job uh, you know that's those guys jobs uh, you know I'm only focused on trying to make the team better uh, win some games uh, you know play hard every night uh, I try to lead you know, the guys that we have here, uh, and I'm sure they feel the same way because, you know, our chemistry has been excellent uh, despite, you know, everything that's been happening in the, uh, the last few months. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, uh, I, don't, I don't really care. Um, but my question is, you know, you all never really did that from what I remember and what I saw. You all didn't really play the – point the finger game or if you did you did it behind closed doors you didn't do it out in the public do you think that that really kind of started a trickle down effect to their you know um disruption of chemistry as far as the public um criticism and pointing fingers because i mean and you can correct me if i'm wrong maybe i'm wrong but i don't remember you all doing that at all uh to each other talking about you and ai and the rest of the guys yeah well, I mean, we didn't do it to each other, but it was some issues. If you remember with Coach Brown and AI. <laughs> now, Coach Brown did it. Now, I, I will say, I remember Coach Brown doing it. Yeah, Coach Brown now, it. I don't remember a, you all doing it to each other. Player, yeah, from a player standpoint, like you had guys that didn't see the eye to eye. And I haven't been on a team in my life that had guys that didn't see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, like when we left that locker room, we was on that court, we were a team. Um, you. you, you I think we had some guys that maybe said some stuff, you know, sources said. I think we had some of that stuff going on. But at the end of the day, it, it didn't impact us playing. Um, it didn't impact how hard we competed. And I think for the most part, it didn't impact the guys that was really getting the most minutes. Um, you know, you had guys, I'm sure, were disappointed with their shot selection and other things on our team. Um, that, that was there. We had guys that complained about that. Um but I think Coach Brown did a good job addressing that. And I think as a team, guys would hold other, other teammates accountable. Um, so it, it was it was not squeaky clean, but we were able to have a good enough relationship with each other that we was able to, you know, kind of fix and monitor any things that may, you know, get out of whack. So, but, but there is a oh, difference right. between a player saying that they wanted more playing time and they want to be able to get more shots than a player saying, we lost the game because of him. <laughs> you know what I mean? There, there's, there's a difference between the two, right? Yes, uh, yeah. definitely. I mean, I think that, and I, I personally think when you have that situation, it's not just that situation that's the reason why they're saying that. Mm. It's built up from other things that, that has happened for someone to get to the point where they point and blame. So you just a guy have a you know end of the game and he he been playing great and he's an all star and then he makes some plays where you lose the game and everybody kind of point at that. Well, you're not going to just point at him and say we lost the season because of him. If all he's done all these other things, so it had to be some other built up or some fractures in the relationship leading to that point for guys that kind of feel like they need to say that, especially publicly. In and my you, opinion. Right, right, right. And, and you mentioned. Uh, when Coach Brown said things publicly about AI, that's where a lot of the issues started. That's where there was a lot of friction. And I, I mean, I, I, per, you know, and, and Doc Rivers, and again, we can play exactly what Doc Rivers said um, after the finals, after, I mean, after the, the playoffs when, when they lost. So we can, we can play that. Doc, do you think Ben Simmons can, can still be a point guard for, for a championship team like the one you guys want to become? Yeah, David, I don't know that question or the answer to that right now. Um, you know, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, but I, I, I just think that as a coach, you know, and you're coaching now, I, I, I coach at an AAU level. Um, it's like who's coached the young guys. I just don't believe that publicly criticizing your own players is the way to go. You know what I mean? I mean, I, behind closed doors, you criticize, tell them whatever, you know what I mean? That's different in the locker room. But publicly, as as you brought up with with Coach Brown when he started publicly criticizing AI, um, there is a parallel to be drawn to when Doc Rivers publicly criticized Ben Simmons. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, Doc said what he said, um, and I don't really know what he said, to be honest with you. I just know that people have made an, uh, an issue out of it. Um, but I do feel that Doc said something, and I felt if that was the only issue, what he said, that was something that could be worked out. So I still believe, and I go back to what I said before, then there was something building up to that to make that part just like, to me, that was like, okay, I'm done. I'm done moment. And I don't think that if that was the only thing, it would just be I'm a, I'm a done, I'm done moment. If that's where you want to be and that's what you're passionate about doing and you're having fun, I just don't think that one moment would have been the end. So I just think it was still to built up a lot of things that we don't know um, that was going on in that locker room. I just think that they had major issues in that locker room, whether it be organization player or a player player or a coach player. And so, so let's let's go over a little bit of where we are now with it. You know, Ben Simmons came back. Um, you know, after he sat out from from um, training camp, he came back. He looked a little bit disinterested um, during the practices, and then he got suspended. And so, what is your outlook on where things are now? Like, where do they go from here? I mean, they're fractured. I mean, it's out there obviously fractured. I mean, he, he needs and wants to probably get traded. I mean, it's just to me, it's just not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. I, I, I don't think the relationship can be repaired. I think they can kind of move on and be repaired for him to play. But I think there's it's, it's so fractured, and I don't even know why. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't even know, like, why it's, it's like that. But it's not going to be fun playing in Philly. It's not. Um, so, and that's not going to change, and mm -hmm. and not in the near future. So, you, what, what what's going to happen? Can't be fun practice. Obviously, it's not. I mean, is Doc going to start him? Is he not going to start him? How much is he going to play him? So, it's going to be issues based. But now it's just issues off the court. Eventually, it's going to be issues on the court. If he plays, if he doesn't play, how he plays, who he plays with. It's just going to be more and more an issue. One, one of the things that um, all three of them, actually, in my article, Theo Ratliff, Larry Hughes, and George Lynch, all said was that he has to win over the Philly fans. And they all had their doubts of how that was going to be able to be possible. Now, this was before he was suspended for conduct detrimental to the team and before he came back and showed you know, that he was disinterested in practice and didn't get in a drill and all of that. Do you think that there's any way possible now that he could win over the Philly fans, or is that kind of a done deal now? It's really just probably done with I think it's I think it's possible, but, you know, he would have to, one, um, have some form of a statement, whatever that may be, um, saying that he wants to be there in some, some form or way. Um, then, two, I think he just compete play hard they'll see the passion they'll see that it's authentic and then play well i mean you know improve on whatever he feels like or they feel like he needs to improve on and, and play well and they win if those four happen trust me yes but it'd be all right when, when, and when, i don't think it'd be fine if those things happen um, right but it's just it's just gonna be tough to get there um with the state that they're in right now you know, winning can cure quite a bit. Um, and we, we both have seen situations where winning, you know, problems get exasperated when, when you start racking up losses. Uh, but winning winning can cure a lot. You know, if, if you, you are the coach, say you are the coach of Philly, right, uh, right now, how would you orchestrate everything? How would you even orchestrate um, Ben Simmons playing, you know, as a starter? So let's say as a starter, um what how how would you run the offense would you make him try to prove that he can shoot from the outside would you take advantage of his height being 6'10 and having him back down most guards what is he complaining against Steph Curry and you know what I mean guards that are a lot shorter um you know would you move him to a different position to have him not even be in a point what would Eric Snow do as the point I mean, guard he's, he's been an all-star being the point guard you know that's what I'm true. saying? Like that's what he's been, um, and that's what he's—he was the number one pick being the point guard. So I wouldn't change that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think you just got to find ways to 
And that's where maybe him playing with him could be an issue because he's, you know, and B obviously dominates in the paint and he probably needs to paint a little more. Um, because it, it really depends like who, who who's guarding him. Team's going to put point guards on him. He should maybe slash and post a little more and play out of the post or play out of the elbow. Um, and, and I always said, like, I like everything Ben is doing. I've never, I've been one to say, I, I don't think that he needs to shoot threes. I firmly believe that. I believe that my belief has always been he just had to make free throws. The one thing I know about shooting is missing threes will make you drive to the basket. Mm -hmm. Missing free throws and make mm -hmm. you not want the ball. That's and true. so I think that he has to be able to improve on that. And to think that I don't, I don't think he ever needs to be a three point shooter. That's just my opinion. If he's making free throws, because he was, he can still be efficient. He can still punish teams um, based on posting the little guys, going out of them, you know, taking the big guys on the perimeter and attacking them and playing in transition. And I think he, I think. Making free throws will make him much more aggressive to score, which will make him much more aggressive to make plays for other people, which is awesome to me the team. Um, but I would have him play the exact same way, but I think that they need to find ways to utilize him in the paint. Maybe, you know, maybe he plays all the minutes when Joel doesn't play. And you kind of find ways to slash it into the post and in transition, posting play out of the post and let him score that way because eventually teams will have to double. So you got to put him in a position where he can draw the crowd and draw a double, play over the crowd, play out of the double, or pass out of it. Right, right. Now, right. You, you know, Kendrick Perkins made an interesting point on ESPN the other day. Um, he said that he felt that Doc Rivers set him up. He said that um, – you know, they wanted to figure out a way to suspend him. And, you know, the, the organization was holding a little bit of a grudge. This is, you know, what was Kendrick Perkins' point. And he said that, um, you know, he felt that Doc Rivers kind of set him up. Did you really see it that way, or do, do you have a different opinion? I, would, I wouldn't necessarily say Doc him up. Really pay attention to it that much as far as what people say. And the actions they do, um, but I can say that it didn't surprise me. You know, what I'm saying that something like that happened. You know, you have a guy that's come back is disinterested in being there, and you get into practice, you get in some sessions, and it, in my opinion, and I'm just thinking out loud that maybe he wasn't starting, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't in the rotation. They kind of brought him along slowly and lately, and eventually you're gonna react like like us all. If we all came back to camp and you had a little disagreement, and they and you and you're a starter, or you're 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 playing twenty minutes, thirty minutes, and they play five ten. All of us would have an issue with that, right. regardless of what's going on. Because um, right. professional sports has always been different than the other sports. You can miss as much time as you want and have your issues, but sometimes when you come back, it's like you're back. Right. So if you have a guy like him that's never right. been a reserve in his life, <laughs> that that could be an issue. So right. I don't know if Doc kind of set him up because I don't really know the right. details of what happened. I'm sure Kendrick probably has more ins and outs than I do, but I don't I don't really know. I just know I wasn't surprised. Got you. Got you. But you do think it's salvageable. I mean, you know, a lot of people all, all on, um, you know, sports radio, all today, all yesterday, everybody's saying it's over, it's, it's, it's settled, they're not going to work. They trade him eventually. There's no way he played. That's pretty much the conclusion that everybody that I hear is saying. But you're saying that it is possible that this could be salvageable. Like that, you know, that all is not lost. Yeah, That's if, just if, if those four things happen, <laughs> yeah, I think it can be. But um, I don't think you can go with without one of those four things happen. I think all four of them have to happen. He has to have some form of. Um, commitment. He has to have that effort um, every night, that passion and enthusiasm. Um, has to play well, and they have to win. So then I think that all bygones can be forgotten, and the yeah. team has to do their part. But I just don't – I don't see all four of them happen happening because I think that um, either the commitment won't come or – 
you know, the passion is going to be hard if you want to leave to come and play hard night and night and, and then in a town is really going to be hard on you. Let's be real about it. Ethan. They're going to be hard on them. So a commitment has to be made in order for, to get to that point, because if the commitment isn't there and they're hard on you, you're going to say, man, I'm done with this. So the commitment got to be there. So let, let's let's do this. I want I want to do this. Um, you as as Eric Snow, as the as the veteran, as the as the the general, you know what I mean, who has been able to deal with you know different situations, different personalities. You played with young LeBron. You played with you know what I mean. You you was able to have these talks with people in the locker room when I'm sure different things came up. I want you to do this. Yeah. Look into the camera, right? And tell me as if you're speaking directly to Ben Simmons, how you would advise him to go from this point on. Tell me everything that you would say to him. Just lay it all out and the advice that you would give him well, it's, as the OG. You know what I mean? And tell him it's, what you have. It's interesting that you it's interesting that you ask that question because being as you say the OG, mm -hmm. my perspective has shifted based on now and when I play. Um I firmly believe it's hard for Ben to have that perspective and come and make that commitment if Joel don't feel the same way. I think that them collectively would have to make that call. They would have to make that commitment. Um, and I think Doc Rivers and all of them could be on board, but I think it has to come from your top player and your other players. They got to be sort of the voice with Ben. He'd sort of make a commitment, but they got to do it together. I don't think that individually I can give him the advice and be like, hey, this is how you handle it. I think at the end of the day, the four things that I kind of talked about, but being making a commitment and getting better and playing hard is what he has to do. But I still think that it has to be other pieces brought in for this thing to, if it was to get back together and work, it can't just be Ben. It had to be some other people um, Joel and Doc and the organization getting in, getting um, involved too and saying, hey, no matter how y'all feel, no matter what y'all do, we're going to do this collectively and we're going to do it together um, in order for, in my opinion, for it to work. All right. I got you. Okay. Well, that's it. Well, I, I, I hope it does work out. You know what I mean? Ben is a, is a special player and I, it's, it's, it's unfortunate because they were the number one team in the East. During the regular season last year, we'll forget that. Yeah, they were number one seed last year. <laughs> yes, they were. They were looking good. It was clicking well, I mean, all I think that if you, you look at you look at from the standpoint of you're the number one seed, and it's been 20 years since we went to the finals, and it was what I think 18 years before that that they had went to the finals. So it's sort of like the time, right? You know, it's like not like yo, we should be going to the finals. The Milwaukee Bucks just won the championship. We had the number one seed. Like it can be done. So it's, 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 I think people are kind of getting upset because they kind of feel like this was sort of our time too. And you got two mm -hmm. young guys that are leading the team that are, you know, really good and big and special players. So this, you know, like I know, like this doesn't, doesn't happen often. So you got to take advantage of that when you can. Right. Definitely agree. Right. Definitely agree. Well, I appreciate you bringing this down. So what's next for Eric Snow? What can we expect from Eric Snow here in the near future? <sighs> Man, you know, you know, it's I'm, I'm open, man. I um, I mean, I got boys all over, sons in college and high school, and younger boys. So, I mean, I really find myself traveling over the country, you know, watching them and kind of being a part of their life and and, and kind of enjoying that part. But I'm open, man. If any anything happens to come my way, I'm you know, coaching or basketball, anything. I, you know, basketball's been so good to me that um, you know, I'll definitely take any opportunities. But right now, you know, enjoying being a part of the game in any way and, and, and enjoying time with my family. That's great. That's great. So before I let you go, I got to ask you this question, all right? Off topic. Um, got to ask you this question. You had this way of playing mind games with the opponent that was special. And I remember this. You know what I mean? I, I remember watching the playoffs. I believe you are playing against New Jersey. They were Jersey then. And I remember you baiting Mikey Moore. You remember that? And, yeah. and you got Mikey Moore to react. He tried to throw an elbow. He missed, but it got him a flagrant. You know, I, I remember you got me one time with that. You know what I mean? You got me, did a little something, 
And I responded and reacted because I was all emotional the way I would play. And I got like a technical and I looked back at you and you had this little mischievous smile. So I was like, oh, he got me. You know what I'm saying? I was like, that gummit. I was just mad. So I want to ask you this. I remember watching you do that to Tracy McGrady. And you got him to react, and he got kicked out of the game. Now, just to set the tone for this, McGrady was killing everybody that year. Like, I mean, we had played yeah. him that when he was in Orlando. He had just gave us, like, 70. Or it seemed like it was 70. I remember – Coach Eddie Jordan was trying all kind of defensive schemes and strategies and what none of them working, right? So you you was able to get under his skin, got him to react, and you got him thrown out the game. Talk about how the art of that. Because there is an art to it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, some of it is you just gotta know. Like with T Mac, you know, I was tapping him on the leg and he didn't like it. Um, you know, he felt it was a dirty play. I don't think it was a dirty play. It was, you know, uncalled for, but it wasn't a dirty play. Um, right. but he was killing everybody. Like I was trying to do anything I could to slow him down. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't trying to get anybody kicked out, but I was trying to slow him down. I mean, it was really nothing I could do if he just right. you know, just raising up shooting. Um, but I think at the same time, you you try to get under people's skin without being, you know, doing you know anything is illegal. Um, right. You know, if you say something to somebody or tap them and you know fake and do all the you know you know flop and do all the other stuff it's no different than people flopping it's sort of the same thing um right. but you know i came in right. you know the league was different when i came in i'm a little older than you when i came in like i was four-year college student and two of my third i think my third year in the nba i think i was still the youngest on the team uh. Like you would never have it now. So I, I, I came in with the Frank Burkowski's and the Sam Perkins and all those guys and all these guys doing all these tricks on me. So I'm like, man, what are they doing? Like so I basically was kind of using some of the stuff that I got, got from you. the from the old players, kind of using tricks and tap a guy or say something, and the guy responds. And the most times the guys wouldn't even really responding towards like I think your situation with me, I think you and I, I kind of remember that it was <laughs> you weren't even into me like it was like you and somebody else and i just had right. maybe they tried to get all from you or something you got me. so i remember what it was i just, was, I just remember that mischievous smile yeah. after i got the tech that's what i really remember so i'm like you out here having fun like i ain't really trying to you know i ain't gonna fight nobody so i'm just <laughs> I'm here like trying to have a little fun if, if you know you can kind of get somebody there um and then most times you come over and be like man I'm, you know i'm just you know just yeah. messing with you, man. Like, yeah. like it ain't really trying to. Like I ain't never really trying to go there, um, playing sports or basketball in any way. Because you know, for me, I had a passion for playing and just being around the game. But yeah, it's it's just because I wasn't that talented guy. I wasn't the guy that can come out and <laughs> light it up every night. So you got to try to find an edge one way or another. Yeah, I remember Kurt Thomas got me. Oh, uh, he would pull the chair. So we posting up and yes. stuff. Then he would pull me back and pull me chair, and I'd fall down. I was all mad, and he was just smiling to you. You and Kirk Thomas, y'all were the two people that had all the tricks. I was like, hey, they, they got me. All right, so one more question. This will be the last question. Tell me about young LeBron, young LeBron with Cleveland. You know, how was young LeBron? What, the, what did he come in already possessing that was so much different than what most young players, you know what I mean, well, come into I the league with? Outside of the talent, um how much respected knowledge he had for the game and the older people played so I, I would do this thing with players like younger person when i was in cleveland and we would go to the each arena and we would have to i would be like okay name three or four of those retired jerseys up top mm. and lebron could always do it he could always do it so I wouldn't even be talking to him most times. And then he would come and say, oh, that's such and such, you know, because that's just who he was. So his knowledge of the game in such a longevity, I think, was was pretty good. Like, he, he had a good feel for the game. But I think um, at a young age, and I, and I always remember, like, my second oldest right now is 19, and that's how old he was when my that's first year. Crazy. Was. That's crazy. Um, and, and so you know, I'm thinking, like, this – Joke my son, like, man, come on, man. Like, the way you so you so silly. And he was, like, man, you know what I'm saying? So, um, but he 
at that age was he was a 19 year old but he was a mature player if you mm -hmm. know what i mean mm -hmm. um just his game was so mature that you knew like this is special like this isn't something that's just going to this ain't no not even a uh five year thing this is like something that probably may never happen again type guy right, right. and right. we used to always say it like like he got a chance and, and what that meant was like, he got a chance to be one of the best, if not the best to ever play. Like we, we were saying it at a young age, like he got a chance, young fella got a chance. Mm -hmm. And we all knew what that meant because it was like, yo, this, this is different. Right. <laughs> no, this is right. different. This is special. Um, what you, what you seeing right here. And, and I was there and, and I can remember when, um, Michigan state called me, I think maybe his freshman or sophomore year was like, Hey, it's you know, it's a young guy from your from your area mm -hmm. that he may start recruiting. I'm like, oh, okay, what's his name? And he told me. And then so maybe like a year or two later, I was like, Well, how's it going? Are y'all still recruiting LeBron James? Said, oh no, he 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 won't go to college. <laughs> so he was like a sophomore <laughs> junior telling me that he wouldn't even go to college. Wow. Um, so that's how they kind of seen him and then he's not only lived up to the hype and, and surpassed it, but you 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 knew it was coming. Like he he's a guy that it's it's interesting for him to be as good and how much he's accomplished. Mm -hmm. I can honestly say I'm not surprised. Like that's that's how good he was then. That you that I could be like I'm not surprised that he's right. done this. All right. Wow. All right. Well, that's what's up. That's what's up. Well, hey, I appreciate you coming on. Um, I hope you do get back into coaching. Uh, because you know you your knowledge of the game, uh, the way that other people speak about you, um, the the respect that players you know AI included, but a lot of players speak about you. I remember even when we're in the union um, and going to some of the meetings and stuff like that, and the way hearing other people speak about you, people have a lot of respect for you. Um, so me personally, I would like to see you back coaching um, in some capacity, but. Much respect to you. I appreciate you coming on. And uh, right. you know what I mean? Stay safe out there. And thanks again. Thanks, you too, man.